you are joining us, thank you for joining us. We have with us um, uh, Senator Saud Angwa. Uh, before I formally introduce him, uh, just let me introduce the program uh, briefly. Uh, this is the Fireside Chart series. Uh, my name again is Fred Kodjo Cheme, and I'll be your host. Today, we are honored to be joined with us, um, a very hardworking individual. And um, he goes by the, state, uh, the name of Senator Saud Anwar. He's a medical doctor by profession, and I'll I'll tell you about you know I'll give you a brief bio of him in uh, in, a, in a short while. Uh, as you all know, this is a very busy ele electoral season, and the senator is very busy. And uh, in, in addition to his senatorial work, uh, he's also a medical doctor, and he's been doing a lot of work in the hospitals due to the COVID pandemic. And uh, those of us in Connecticut have been very much following him. And the you know the busy schedule that he keeps be shuffling between the two places. So please, uh, before I introduce the senator, let me ask that if you are you you've been able to join us, please send uh, and share the link with your friends. Uh, we are about to get started. We apologize again for the delay. Uh, senator Anwar, please, I'm going to uh, basically read a brief bio of you. I'm going to be very brief because your bio is quite long. You've done many things in your life. So please bear with me as I read this to our audience. Medase. <laughs> and so that one is very fluent in our key language as well. So if you have questions, please feel free to speak any language that you care for. <laughs> we'll be able to, you know, uh, he'll be able to answer. Okay. Uh, Dr. Saud Anwar is a state senator representing the third district of Connecticut in the towns of East Hartford, Ellington, East Windsor, and South Windsor. Senator Anwar is a medical doctor by profession and specializes in lung diseases, critical care, occupational and environmental medicine. He currently serves as the chair of the Department of Internal Medicine at Manchester Memorial Hospital and Rockville General Hospital. Senator Anwar was trained in pulmonary and critical care medicine and holds a master's degree in public health from Yale University. Senator Anwar also works with the humanitarian and peace initiatives on a local, national and global scale. He has organized medical missions for disaster relief, receiving citations for doing so from former Governor Judy Rell, the United States Senator Richard Blumenthal, and Lieutenant Governor Susan Bicewitz. He served as a consultant to the FBI's Multicultural Advisory Co uh, Committee and spoke at conferences for the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of Former Secretary uh, of Homeland Security, uh, Janet Napolitano. Senator Anwar was the first was first elected to public office in 2011 as a member of the South Windsor Town Council, and he served two terms as mayor of South Windsor. Senator Anwar, thank you for honoring our invitation. We really appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much, Freddie. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. Senator, you've been doing so much for everyone else. I've been following you for the past year, uh, especially since COVID hit. And um, you know, we want to ask you, how are you and your family doing? We're very blessed. Thank you for asking me, Freddie. It's, it's been, uh, uh, initially when we had the pandemic, we had so many patients, it was a roller coaster ride because we wanted to make sure that the family is safe and the patients are safe. And, and uh, we worked very hard and, and by the higher powers grace, we have uh, been okay so far. Thank you for that very Very well, question. very well. We, we are very happy to hear that. Because when the pandemic started, most of us were, you know, um, at that are not in the medical field. You know, it was very new to us. We're still trying to understand. There was a lot of confusion. You know, most of us started working from home and everything was on lockdown. So following a lot of your Facebook lives and the discussions that you had trying to teach us what the pandemic, you know, meant and what we should do to keep ourselves and our family safe was very helpful. I must say that. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Uh, only three weeks ago, we were hovering around 1% of infections in Connecticut. We were doing quite well. And today we are up around 6%, you know, with over 70,000 cases right here in Connecticut. How's the state doing with the pandemic at this moment? Uh, Fred, I'm not, uh, I'm afraid we are not doing as well as we should or we could. And that's, I think, uh, my concern and my challenge right now is that, uh, Really what's happening at this time is that if you look at the number of towns and across the state, the number of towns who are in the red uh, zone have increased and the number of cases in the state of Connecticut are increasing rapidly. Um, 
unless we actually have a comprehensive statewide strategy, we will not be able to get a better handle on this. And that's my fear that uh, the numbers are increasing. Okay, wow. So do you think, I mean, we did, we were warned that, you know, around fall, things will kind of go up again. So we've been hoping it won't happen, but it did. Do you think with the current surge, I mean, are we, I mean, can we be hopeful that maybe in the next month or so, things will gradually decline and then we'll get back to at least that 1% range or, you know, even lower? I, I wish I could say that because we have not even seen the turnaround at this point. And we have not seen any, at least I've not seen any policy from our state government yet that is going to change things around. So it is rising, it is increasing. Till it turns around, we cannot predict if it's going to come down. And, and, and I've not seen any policy actions as of right now that are going to make this turn around yet. So I'm afraid that I'm not bearing good news about it turning around the way I and you would expect and all the, your listeners would expect it to. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's not very, you know, uh, uh, for, for, you know, heartwarming because we've been hoping that at least if we, you know, do everything that you're supposed to do, that things will go down. But, you know, as you say, you're not sure you know, when that will happen. Um, you know, in addition to social distancing, washing of hands, wearing masks, using hand sanitizers, we've been doing everything religiously as, uh, you know, uh, medical people in the medical field like yourself have advised us to do. And we tell our friends and family to continue doing the same. And, you know, that has helped. For those of us in New England, in Connecticut, we've seen that trend is helping, you know, in terms of, you know, us following the protocols. Um, there have been an assurance that, you know, there's something in terms of a cure coming and we've heard of remdesivir. Uh, do you think that is something that uh, we can hope that, you know, maybe in the next month or so, it, it, you know, it may do the job, you know, curing us? Sure, sure. Uh, what, what we have learned is we are managing this disease far better than what we were managing back in March. We were all learning. So what has happened is we started to learn from what the Chinese experience was then we started to learn from the experience of our Italian uh, uh, in Italy. And then, then subsequently uh, in the United States, we started to generate our, our own data and started to see what was the best way to be able to address this. Uh, a very small percentage, well, 5% or so people will get very sick if they are in the high risk category. Okay. When they get that sick and they are in the intensive care unit, we have the capacity to be able to manage them far better than what we were managing before. So yes, we have been able to turn things around and we have a lot more uh, medications in our toolbox to be able to be ahead of the curve and, and, and address the disease in an effective manner. Okay. Um, I know, you know, the state, the governor and, um, you know, his staff, everybody, the legislature, everybody's doing, uh, working very hard around the clock to make sure that people are taking care of, you know, who are in need. Um, what is the state doing in terms of providing immediate, you know, some kind of food and shelter for those who are in, in, in most need? And, um, you know, what, what are they doing? I, I heard recently that the governor uh, has provided an assistance of 33 million to people who are, you know, hurting in with rent payments for landlords who are, you know, not recouping their money. Uh, do you think 33 million is enough? And, you know, what other support is out there? Right. So right now, uh, we literally need everybody to be able to help out. We are in unprecedented territory with the number of people who are unemployed in our state, which has gone up. The number of businesses that are hurting have increased as well. And along with these changes that we have seen, we also have a people who cannot afford to pay their rent. So okay. I'm, I'm currently the chair of the department, uh, the housing committee, and then I work very closely with the Department of Housing. I'm one of the co-chairs. And um, uh, initially, uh, the federal government had provided some help, but the state was able to try and put some resources. Initially, uh, we were able to put some $20 million. Recently, the governor and, and the, uh, through the efforts of a lot of people, including our advocacy efforts that I've been able to put forward, we've been able to in increase the amount to about $40 million now uh, to able, be able to help the people. Okay. And, and this is for rental assistance and landlord protection with the landlords who actually are, have to stay, still pay their mortgages and get some money. So that is moving in the right direction. I am part of meetings with the Department of Housing almost on a weekly basis to get an update on where we are and what's going on. If these numbers, the dollar amount starts to be lower and we have spent all the money, um, 
I have been assured by the commissioner of housing uh, who works very hard and the entire team in the department of housing is working very hard to make sure that we will work with the governor's office to ask for more money if we need it. Very well, very well. Uh, I, I appreciate you updating us that, you know, the money was bumped up to 40 million from 33 million. That's very reassuring. And I hope, you know, as time goes on, uh, they, they can continue to raise it because we are seeing a lot of need out there. And um, hopefully uh, the state will be able to come in, in, in you know, and, and support, um, you know, people who are in need. Um, as you know, the current unemployment rate is rising. You know, right now in Connecticut, we are about 7.8%. And the national average is about 7.9. So we, we are, you know, very much up there. Um, the job losses, you know, due to COVID, as we all know, are happening. And um, as you know, one of your districts, I'm one of your towns, uh, East Hartford, recently, Pratt & Whitney, which is, a, you know, one of the biggest aerospace companies, probably in the US and in Connecticut, um, announced that they, they're going to cut about 450 salary uh, positions. How is this going to affect the town of East Hartford and, the, and Connecticut in general? And you know, what's the state going to do about that? Yeah, so, so one, one of the things, uh, uh, Freddie, we have seen is we actually have been the manufacturing hub in this area in the aerospace industry. And for obvious reasons, the aerospace industry is hurting quite a bit because people aren't traveling as much all over the world in this pandemic. The countries that had ordered new airplanes and, and, and their engines that they needed um, they are actually taking their orders back. And as a result, because of the reduction in the number of orders, these companies are reassessing their workforce. So that's one part. And then there are so many more companies that are linked with um, the Pratt & Whitney and the aerospace industry, and they are all hurting. Okay. Uh, so this is going to have an impact on our workforce. And now this manufacturing is one part of that puzzle. If you look at in the healthcare field, people are losing the hospitality industry if you look at the hotels and, and, and some of those industries, they have been hurt so significantly and our communities have been part of that workforce and they are hurting right now. And, and that's why what I've done is I'm trying to work in, in a strategic manner to try and protect our communities. Um, a few weeks ago, what I did was I actually had a, a Zoom conference that I've put on my Facebook and I would invite people to, to visit my Facebook page, Senator Saud Anwar Facebook page where I was able to get some of the, the stakeholders in, in one place, and, and which included the Capital Workforce Partners, which okay. included uh, Goodwin University, which included, again, uh, the, the Department of Economic Development for, and Community Development from the state of Connecticut. And we put our heads together and started to at least share with people that we will have to have a long-term strategy for individuals to start to invest in their skills and start to move into industries where they would be able to have a bigger impact. And, and, and whether it's gonna be through the computer training and, 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 and through other areas that are actually still increasing, there is a lot of service industries which are going to remain very vibrant and opportunities will be there. So that's what it's gonna take is for us to retool ourselves and in community members who are working hard, who have the skills, we be we able to work with the university to get training and then hopefully get some jobs in collaboration with some of these partners. Okay, that's excellent. And uh, we'll touch, you know, we'll touch on that some more as we go, uh, because I, I want to ask some other questions on that. Uh, so please, uh, if you are joining us, we are here right now with um, joined by Senator Saud Anwar. Uh, he's the senator for the towns of East Hartford, uh, South, South Windsor, East Windsor, and uh, I believe is it Glastonbury? Ellington. Ellington, Ellington. I'm sorry, Ellington. And um, if you know, you know, the uh, Ghanaians, are, we have a lot of Ghanaian population in East Hartford and Senator Saud Anwar has been a, a huge partner for us. And uh, we are very happy to have him here. And as election season gets, you know, uh, as we get into the election day on, on the third on Tuesday, we want to discuss with him his plans for the state. I mean, for, the, uh, for his districts and uh, what we can expect of him um, in the next election cycle. I mean, next, next, next cycle uh, in, uh, in his position. So thank you for joining us. And uh, please, if you have any questions, feel free to send it. We'll, we'll be able to ask the Senator. Uh, uh, Senator, we just recently uh, saw you advocating for uh, workers in the security industry, people who provide uh, personal uh, protection services for most of our corporate uh, uh, clients, I mean, in Connecticut, 
and um, you know most apartment buildings. They they do a very critical job. And uh, I must tell you, you know, so many years ago when I was in college, I was also considered a security guard. I did the job because you know as a student, that's how I paid my bills. I paid my rent. I you know had a car. And it took care of me very well. I was, I was a young single guy, so it wasn't too much you know, to, 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 to do. Um, but I also had coworkers who were parents and they have families. You know, and I always wondered how they lived on those meager salaries because it wasn't a lot. And um, you, know, you just, you know, I know you spoke to some few people uh, who are in the industry and they don't even have, some of them don't have medical insurance. And you know, they're struggling to pay rent and with the pandemic and everything. Please, can you tell us what you are trying to do for people in this industry? Yeah, so, so I have to tell you now, if you look at with this pandemic, everybody is saying, oh, we love essential workers. We are very happy with essential workers. I am an essential worker. I'm a healthcare worker. And and, and the, the essential workers were the ones when the entire state was locked down, they continue to work. Yes. And, and unfortunately, majority of the essential workers in our state are uh, paid the least amount, if you look at it, the ones who are at the grocery stores, the ones mm -hmm. who are actually doing the security work, the ones who are at the gas stations, everybody who kept the state functioning, oh, protected yeah. our families. Mm -hmm. They were essential workers, but essential workers have never been treated like essential workers. And, and many of them have died, their families have been impacted. And even right now, just saying that you love essential workers isn't gonna be good enough. We will have to take care of them as essential workers. And majority of the essential workers are immigrants, minority communities, and we have to treat everybody in a fair manner, in a respectful manner. And, and, and this is how we are going to be a strong state, strong community. And what we have seen is that the essential workers need, have not been provided the support. I just met uh, um, the individual who actually gets paid 12 some dollars an hour. $12 an hour, if you add it up, it's like $24,000 salary. And, and his healthcare cost is $900 premium for per month. What is he going to eat? How is he going to live? How is he going to take care of his family? And, and these people are standing there protecting us for hours, 12 hour shifts, long shifts. And, and if we as a society and the employers in the state are not going to work with contracting companies who are responsible and taking care of our essential workers, then we are actually losing out on this opportunity to change the status quo that we have seen. So that's why I feel passionately and I stood with them yesterday as well and a day before and I brought them on my Facebook Live to actually share those stories because people need to hear this. Yeah, we really applaud you for doing that. You know, um, most people don't think about that sector. You know, I must tell you, even though they go to work, they see them, once they leave, that's it. You know, it's just a guy, you know, standing there helping, you know, and I think you did a really uh, wonderful job bringing their voices out and letting us hear from them directly, you know, and uh, hopefully the state will come to their aid. Everybody needs uh, health insurance now, especially now. You know, so when you hear that an employee, somebody who has a job doesn't have health insurance, it's quite scary. So thank you for doing that. Medase. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, so one more, I want to go back into the, you know, uh, back again into the workforce, uh, workforce training. And we've heard, you know, the last year, I think we're getting better now, but the, the last year, Connecticut uh, was on the news a lot about people leaving the state to find better uh, jobs or opportunities elsewhere because they didn't think there's enough here. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, I happen to work in Massachusetts, so I'm there a lot of times and they seem to be doing well uh, in most areas, especially when it comes to technology and you know um, the medical uh, health, health, uh, health companies. Yeah. What can we do as a state to retrain our workforce, you know, to make them competitive, you know, give them uh, some advantage because it seems that we, we are lagging behind. Yes. So, so a few things that have happened right now is uh, the fact that the state of Connecticut did a reasonably good job in the first part of the COVID and, and, and the, we were better than the rest of the country at one point. Um, this actually gave a lot of attention to the state. That was one thing. The second thing that has happened is that very affluent rich people in New York and other places, they saw that they could actually work remotely uh, from home and they could do as good a job as they were doing before. 
So a lot of people from Manhattan and, 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 and very uh, rich individuals are starting to move to the state of Connecticut. Now that's fine, that's good news, they're welcome and a lot of people are coming in, that's very, very good news. The issue is that the middle class and the lower middle class, they are the ones who are having difficulties and the retirees are the ones who are looking at state of Connecticut and seeing that the cost of living is very high in the state of Connecticut. So, so I will use what you just said and, and, and give an example of if there was a farm and we are creating a, a, a farm, we have to prepare the land, the soil so that we can actually grow something here. And that would require, first, we have to bring the cost of living in a better place. We have to make sure that the cost of housing, the affordable housing is there, the cost of education, the quality of education, we are very good with the quality of education, but its cost for the higher education is very difficult. So when somebody is going to think about raising their families here, they have to think about the education part, the cost of living part, the cost of utilities. Yes. How are you going to pay for heating, for electricity? And then if you're going to have a business that's going to come, the business is going to ask the same questions. If they are paying less for the electricity in another part of the country, we, they will leave and go there. So we have to create that entire environment or prepare the soil and make policies that makes it easier for the state of Connecticut to become uh, useful. I, I'll give you an example. In the past, I was serving as the mayor of the town of South Windsor, mm -hmm. and we had a strategy which allowed us to become one of the most attractive business places for the state to the point that it became one of the fastest growing areas of the entire state of Connecticut with a number of businesses just looking well at it. Now. Yeah. 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 And then this was because of the policies. We just need to bring the same mindset to the state of Connecticut and say, look, you want the businesses to make home here, but we want the businesses to take care of the workforce over here. And then we want to make sure that we become partners as the state, as a town in this bar partnership. So you are successful, the businesses are successful, but we want the businesses when they're successful to take care of the employees. And then that's a win-win strategy that we'll have to create by, by creating mechanisms. So it's, it, it requires a lot of things to come into place and then we will have to make this as a priority because we want our young people to, to stay in our state. When they grow up, they get the finest education, they all move out and we have to keep them here because of giving them opportunities in all, all possible ways. No, uh, thank you uh, for explaining that. And I, I must tell you, I've, I've, been, uh, I've been living in Connecticut for over uh, 22, 23 years now. And I must tell you, I really, I'm in love with this state. You know, I've had the opportunity to travel, I've, you know, could have moved anywhere, but I always decide to just stay right here in Connecticut. It's uh, New England in general is a beautiful place, as you all know. In Connecticut, you know, I just love the location and everything that the state has to offer. So we have to continue to do better uh, for our citizens, keep everybody here, and you know, even bring attract more businesses and people to come in. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to shift a little bit uh, to immigration. Um, well, I know you work with many African uh, immigrants in the hospitals, especially. Uh, you work with uh, a lot of Ghanaians as well. How do you find um, your working? How do you find working with them? I mean, how's the working relationship? Um, I, I just uh, love the Ghanaian. The, all these little words that I say, it's the same. And uh, uh, you say Namesh Rao, all of these things. <laughs> these are my Ghanaian friends who have taught me these uh, beautiful words Excellent. from your beautiful language, from beautiful well. people. Very well-trained individuals, very professional and very caring. And, and, and I think that is the strength of uh, Ghanaian community and, and all immigrant communities. But um, in the healthcare, we are seeing a lot of people come from Ghana and yes. they're very well trained and they speak well, they communicate well, they take care of the patients, they're hardworking, they're not afraid to take care of things. So, and then there are actually frontline workers right now in the healthcare industry, whether it is in the inpatient hospitals or in rehab facilities or nursing homes, they have been putting their lives online to be able to take care of our families and the loved ones of the entire state of Connecticut. So I think that is something that the more we recognize and highlight, the more valuable this is because these are people who are putting their lives in danger to take care of our families and, and elderly in our community. And, and, and they do it with their heart. And, and uh, you make the state far more beautiful. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate how I would. We appreciate that, especially coming from you. And uh, that's something that we don't usually hear. But I can tell you that, you know, within your districts, you know, there are several Ghanaian families there. 
you know, all over Connecticut, all over the U.S., every Ghanaian family has at least one healthcare worker in there. I can promise you that. And and in my family, it's, it's, there's just so many I can't count. <laughs> so you know, they, they they love what they do and they do it with their heart. You know, so absolutely. We appreciate that. Um, you know, as you know, the current government has instituted many measures to curb legal legal immigration. And I'm not even talking illegal, legal immigration, including reducing the number of refugees allowed to be admitted, increasing the cost of fees associated with uh, naturalization processes and uh, other consular services, including green cards. Uh, Connecticut has been an advocate for immigrants. Um, and uh, I was just wondering, uh, do you think there is more the state can do? I know this is a federal issue most of the time, but do you think there's more the state can do to show, or to you know, at least help immigrants both legal and illegal. Yeah, yeah. So Freddie, I, what I would say to, to people who talk about this, and I'll explain to you the common scenario. If somebody's uh, one family member, your, your, your child or your father or your brother or your, your, your wife is a US citizen and you are in going to be with them uh, as uh, you come here legally to become a part of the family, and then you are waiting in line to get your paperwork. And that paperwork has been blocked for unknown reason because you have no access to it. So you have two options. You either leave your child here alone and go back to your country of origin where you are at, even though you have come here legally, or you actually just wait in line and continue to wait in line. But then when the legal processes are stopped, and then they're stopped by the current administration saying that we are stopping the legal process. Then everybody who's in the legal process becomes quote unquote illegal. Mm -hmm. And these are failures of policy. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and who is managing many of these places? Who is managing, we just talked about the healthcare facilities, the essential workers. And, and by the poor policies and stopping the legal processes, we create a policy where people put their families before some of the artificial laws that have been created by individuals with poor decision-making. And, and that's why you, you've created this whole situation. So recognizing that fact, being an advocate to make sure that the smooth uh, law-abiding citizens are part of it. And, and I will say this something, and then people, when they listen to this, some of the groups will yell and scream at me. I can tell you many, if not many, essentially all the immigrants who have been here um, through the legal process or who are waiting for that legal process to come through, they pay, pay more tax than the current president of the United States. <laughs> they are more effective to take care of the citizens who are in need, the people who are taking care of everything. So the, the amount of money that the immigrants are paying for the taxes is in multi-billion dollars. Yes. And the safety is, uh, I have to give you this example, um, the, the likelihood of a person dying uh, from a dog bite is, is multifold more in the United States than somebody dying by a, an action of an immigrant. Hmm. Even though the media is going to project it, at least some medias are going to project it and say all these things. And, and what I'm saying right now is exactly what I said in the Senate floor. When one of my fellow senators was saying something about an immigrant, I actually told him about the probability the probability of that happening is so low. And if you're gonna take one example and then keep mentioning that example, we would look at other examples as well. So again, I get emotional about some of these aspects, but the proportionality has to be looked at, the probabilities have to be looked at, and we have to take care of the people to allow them to be part of the citizenship. The, the country is built on immigrants yes. and, and you cannot actually stop the process, especially because, uh, the, the age that we are in as a state and, and as a country, we are aging society. Mm -hmm. and, and there's going to be a vacuum if we don't have a steady stream of qualified immigrants who come through appropriate processes, who are law-abiding law and are not criminals. So the criminals means that who are harmful, dangerous individuals, as opposed to what the current government is saying is that if you overstayed your visa because you're taking care of your child who was sick, you're a criminal now. That's not a definition of criminal in my mind. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you, you know, uh, speaking a lot on that. 
because often people have been misinformed and um, they, they view every immigrant, you know, they put them in the same bowl, you know, forgetting that there are thousands and thousands of immigrants all over the US, I would say even in the millions, who are providing very critical and essential services to the country. And I don't know where the country would be without immigrants, to be quite honest yes. with you. You know, and uh, so I appreciate you and I hope we can continue to, you know, um, appreciate everyone, re regardless of where they come from and see them as individuals and what they are doing to, 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 to help the world. You know, so thank you. Um, I, I'm just gonna end here. I mean, the Trump administration, as you know, um, has threatened to cut um, funding for sanctuary cities you know, cities who are trying to help immigrants and, you know, um, those in need. Do you think Connecticut is doing enough in this area, making sure that we can support the people who are here and not allow, you know, unjust laws to be taken uh, on, uh, for granted, you know, to abuse? Yeah. So uh, I can tell you the, the, all of the experts and, and from the police chief association, what they have said is that um, they are not federal agents. As soon as the local police becomes part of the federal agencies, their ability to police their communities is negatively impacted in a manner that the police is not able to do their basic function. And then that's part of what everybody have been able to take a public position that they do not want to be a part of this. And they are not interested to be a part of this. What has happened with the current federal government is they are using uh, financial support to the towns and the cities and the state to try and use that as a hook for the, the local police to become a part of the federal agencies. Um, that has backfired. That's not a good strategy. It's an it's a, it's a anti-immigrant strategy and, and where it means that they would look at the skin of a person and be able to say, oh, well, you are an immigrant. And, say, and how can you say that? Mm -hmm. Just because I look a little different. And that is a slippery slope. Yeah. And that is an unhealthy way of a society. We need to look at the police, and I know you will probably hopefully ask me some questions about that too, but when you look at the police, the person should feel comfortable rather than be afraid. And, and, and that is why the police chiefs have been smart enough to come up and say, look, look, this policy doesn't work. And I support the police chief's policies on this one. Okay, thank you. Um, DACA, Deferred Action for uh, Childhood Arrivals. That's um, a law, as you know, that President Obama put in place. Uh, the current president uh, decided to, you know, get rid of it. And luckily the court stepped in and there is a temporary injunction on this law to prevent the government from deporting, you know, child, you know, children and students who are in school, you know, who've lived in America for quite all their lives mostly. Are you hopeful that that will become law in 2021? I, I, I sure hope that that would be the way we move forward because that is what our values are. We want to take care. Look, um, our strength in the United States is because of our institutions and the students in these institutions who have become institutions themselves. And we have been able to attract the ones who are willing to work hard, abide by the rules, hard work, and, 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 and smartest people. And the, the students and, and, and individuals that I met who have been um, uh, quote unquote in the DACA category, they are making our country smarter, stronger, and better. They have served in the military. They've been willing to give their lives. And, and if we can't treat them right, how are we going to bring this society together? Uh, this is such a basic, simple thing. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, I'm surprised at times that this has been made into a political issue by uh, people, which is not smart on their part. They're, they're very short-term thinking very short-term thinking and not a smart way to build a society. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that. Um, Senator, you've been uh, recently appointed to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, which advises on development of national civil rights policy and enhanced uh, federal civil rights laws. How important is this uh, work uh, commission to you? Uh, uh, Fred, this is a very important commission. Uh, it is an advisory role. But what, what I see is that the civil rights will require the community to speak up, but the community that is targeted may not be able to speak as comfortably. So then the organizations would come to speak about this. And then the organizations need to be supported by the towns mm -hmm. and the towns need to be supported by the state and the state needs to be supported by the federal government. So you go through the entire chain of this process. I am part of the community. 
and I'm part of organizations. I'm part of the state, thankfully, and I was part of the towns, but now I'm seeing that entire spectrum and I feel connecting all of these dots so that we are all on the same plane and recognize that we will need to protect this. Otherwise, you know, uh, the definition of America is a place which is respectful uh, and, 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 and protective of all people, lives with the values, values the humans, the environment, and, and also has been a beacon of hope historically for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. If you chip away all of these values, uh, we, this is not what America has been. And, and we are better than that as a, as a country, as people, as a society. So we need to protect those values. Yes. And, and, and that's what it's going to take. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, you, you. You spoke with Deacon At Miller, you know, that's a good friend of yours, a uh, very renowned civil rights leader. Uh, about race relations in America. Um, and he says something very profound, and I want to get your comments on that. He said, why would anyone who has dedicated their life to peace do the opposite? He was referring, of course, to uh, police officers who engage in wanton violence, as we have seen uh, recently. Um, many of us forget that police officers are peace officers. Uh, what do you think about that statement, considering our current uh, state of affairs? Look, one smart thing that I have realized is uh, with, when Deacon Art Miller says anything, I, I just say yes to it. <laughs> and <laughs> the reason is that he, his, his, uh, his understanding and wisdom is, is, is uh, above and beyond majority of the people I may have come across in my life. And, and having said that, I would just say is that he's absolutely right that overwhelming majority of the police officers, they wake up in the morning when they wear their uniform they are going to put themselves in harm's way. They are even not sure if they will come back home that day. Not a lot of us who work in this uh, world in the different professions, they, do not they, they don't worry about that fact when they're leaving the home in the morning. So police officer, when they take the oath, they're willing to protect each and every citizen irrespective of what that citizen is. So that's the bottom line that we need to recognize that overwhelming majority of the people are right. The laws are made for the people who don't follow the laws and laws are made for the people who actually give a wrong name and malign the institution of police. Mm -hmm. and, and we make the laws for that particular group so that they can't get away by doing wrong. And that's the part that is, I think, uh, why we need to address some of those things. So the laws that we have made and talked about and in the recent past, they have been made for the people who would not follow those laws or follow the rules. Okay, thank you. Um, you've probably been, um, you, you know, you, you've been working about a House Bill, HB 604, 6004. Uh, is that, has that been made law or is it still, is still in the process? Uh, this is the police. Uh, yes, the Police Accountability uh, Transparency. Yeah, the, so that, that's the Police Accountability Act is a law now. It's a law now. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so I know there is a clause which talks about qualified immunity. Uh, can you tell us what that means? And, you know, yes. there, were, there now, were a lot of controversy over that. Yes. yes. So Fred, this is part of the, the so he, here's the thing. I, I'll give you the scenario. Uh, uh, we know uh, that uh, the recent civil rights challenges that we have seen where an African-American was brutally murdered by a police officer. Uh, here is the reality of the state of laws in our country. And, and I'll talk about state probably, that's probably a better way. In the state of Connecticut, the, the way the laws and, and the, the contracts of uh, immunity, the qualified immunity have been written that individual who murdered that person, if that happened, God forbid, in the state of Connecticut, that individual would have walked away with no civil lawsuit against them. Wow. And, you and, and to me, yeah. okay. and to me, that is a litmus test. That is a litmus test for what our state needs to be. And this law basically says that the police will have the qualified immunity, which means that they will be immune from the actions that they take as a part of their job, except if they do wrongful actions knowingly and with a personal agenda and, and, and an action that is 
based on a bias, based on an action, which is based identifiably, provably that way, then they do not have that protection. Okay. And, and, and so, it, and then uh, many of the people uh, have, have uh, the, the police union have uh, misinterpreted it, uh, even though the lawyers, their own lawyers and the lawyers in the state of Connecticut uh, and, and the lawyers that I have spoken to, uh, they have actually said it very simply that the qualified immunity stays and is protected except in a situation like okay. what we saw in the murder. Okay. Thank and then you. that's a part. And I want to allow as a lawmaker and as a citizen of our state to have a police officer walk scot-free by doing such an action in the state of Connecticut. Yeah. And, and uh, we appreciate, you know, the, the legislature taking this issue on. I mean, I would never think in the <clears throat> years that Connecticut will have such a law in the books. And, um, you know, I'm glad this issue raised that, you know, alarm and um, you were able to do something about it. Uh, that shouldn't happen anywhere. Um, nobody's life should be taken in such a manner. And as you can imagine, it affected everyone. It affected all of us, whether you knew yes. him or not. You know, you could be, I had friends all over the world calling me, asking me questions about what was going on in America. And sometimes you find yourself very emotional when you by yourself somewhere, you know, I'm yeah. in my car driving and I just can't imagine the inhumanity of it, you know? So we, we, we really appreciate, you know, uh, you all working uh, to, to at least prevent that from happening uh, to some extent. Uh, thank yes. you. Uh, do you think we can strike a balance on religious uh, freedoms at the same time as we ensure people's civil liberties, because um, sometimes we seem to think, oh, this this way or that way, you know. But we need to strike a balance because there are pe many people with different uh, personalities and uh, different, um, you know, people have different traits. So there has to be a difference. Whether you know, yeah, you can still worship and still protect somebody somebody's civil liberties. What do you say yes. about? Yes, uh, look, uh, religious freedom is protected in our constitution. That is one of the most critical part of the constitution. That is what makes America actually a, a beacon of hope that uh, right now in many of the other parts of the world, there is persecution based on how people pray, what they pray, what they believe in. And it's unfortunately happening in other parts of the world. And, and everybody who is actually harmed who is a minority in other parts of the world has looked at United States to say, this place has religious protection and religious freedom where the constitution is protecting them. Whatever they believe in, we don't judge that. We should not judge that. It is not our business to judge that. And that is part of our, our responsibility. Now, when somebody actually is going to try and use laws and reasoning to try and take that away, that constitutional protection is critical and that should be tested in the Supreme Court. And that is why all this emotion that we have had about the Supreme Court issues is that, that we want to have a Supreme Court that is impartial to these aspects. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court that is not political on these aspects. And I'll, I'll give you one example, which is a very sad example. After the Second World War, the Japanese were placed in internment camps, Japanese Americans. They were Americans mm -hmm. who were of Japanese heritage. They were put in camps in the United States, a very sad part of the history of the United States. While that, that ruling that came out was against the Constitution, the Supreme Court, when it was challenged, sided against the, the people of Japanese heritage. So then I say that, you know what, the Supreme Court was also political at that time as well. And later, everybody apologized. Why do something that you know in a matter of time you're going to apologize as a country, as people, but you have harmed the communities and, and harmed the, the integrity of the, the country by doing such actions. And then that's why we need to make sure that we remain a morally strong country. And then that was, is a must for us as a, as a, as a country for to remain a beacon and hope for the rest of the world and yeah. show them the path. Yes, um, I, I, I think you are right on with that. Um, we have our concerns about this current Supreme Court and everything that has happened recently. Yeah. Um, we can go on and on about that, you know, with the example that happened during uh, President Obama's term, 
when he nominated someone and it was a no no. And yeah. the same scenario happens even much earlier, I mean, much closer to elections. And we say, oh, no, the rules changed. We rewrote the rules. Now we're going to have our say. And now we have, you know, um, you know, Supreme Court that we don't know what it's going to turn out to be. We, we are still hopeful. Um, but that is what the need for checks and balances really means that, you know, you don't want to have an executive that's so powerful and basically flout the laws of the country, you know, yeah. and the Congress should be able to step up and say, no, you can't do this or that. And the Supreme Court should be able to do the same. So there should be a balance of power everywhere. But that's not the situation we have now. So we are hoping that that will change very soon. Um, final, my final question on the race issue is, uh, do you still hope that there's a, there's a chance for improved race relations um, and elimination of structural racism as we know it uh, in the state and in this state and then, you know, mostly in the, in the country? Uh, do you think there's a chance for that? Uh, we have no choice but to make sure this happens. Now, now I'm gonna speak more as a doctor. This is a cancer in our country if we don't fix it. And this can be very easily fixed by recognizing that it exists, by recognizing that there were laws that created what has been created. Mm -hmm. and, and once we actually identify that and recognize that, then we have to put laws to undo the wrong that we have done. That is how the cancer is gonna be fixed. We actually also look at any faith, every faith, any community, and you recognize it's all about humanity doesn't say what that humanity looks like, doesn't say what that humanity acts like. It talks about humanity of every person. So as soon as we get back to the basics and we get back to the core of our existence as human beings to take care of our fellow human beings, mm -hmm. we will be able to move in the right direction. Um, look, I love what I do as a doctor, but I am here just to, to take care of some of these things because I cannot see my state, my country move in the direction which is unhealthy and, and not sustainable for our society. So I'm trying to intervene to make policies and some people don't like it and they actually are very open and they tell me all sorts of things. But the reality is if we don't intervene and don't take care of it, we will not be a healthy society and I won't allow that. I'll fight to make sure we stay on the right path. Well, Senator, we really appreciate what you are doing. I mean, some people may not like it, but we do. And we're going to continue Thank you. to support you every step of the way so you can continue to bring all this change that you are making uh, and the contributions that you are providing for our state. We really appreciate that. Thank you, Fred. Thank you so yeah, much. Uh, November 3rd, next Tuesday, is, is here. The presidential and congressional elections are upon us now. And, um, you know, America gets to have a say again. Uh, do you think that America needs a new direction? Uh, do we need uh, I, that I, the White House and the Senate? I, I sure hope so. And again, of course, as a Democrat, I, I, I sure hope so and pray so because this current direction is not being healthy. It is not healthy for America within, but also our respect and recognition in the rest of the world is being impacted negatively. So we have to make sure that we go back to, and, and as, as, as uh, the vice president says it beautifully is that we re, re, get back to the soul of America. And then that soul of America is so beautiful, so pure. We have to make sure that we protect that and we bring it back. Thank you. Yeah, that's America that we all know. And that's why we've been able to be part of this America for many years. And uh, because they welcomed us with open arms and no matter where we came from and we never forget where we came from, but that's the beauty of it. That America accepted you as you are and you could keep your culture yeah. and keep who you are and still be a part of America and be an American as well. Amen. We want to Amen. continue that. We want to have that. Most of us have been able to serve in the military and do other things just like other Americans. And we've been able to do that because we were welcome and we felt welcome. We don't want that to change. You know, yes. so we hope that's the that's the America that we go back to, not the America that some people want us to to, to kind of reinvent ourselves to be. So um, I, I hope that changes. Um, what do you think about the importance of minority votes, especially the votes of you know, naturalized immigrants, especially at this critical time? Um, sorry, can you repeat your question again? What do you think that, uh, what do you think about the importance of minority votes, especially- Oh my God, yes. So, 
so look, the minority vote is the key piece of, of our solution. Every vote is important. Every, every, every vote is important. One vote for one individual is equal to two votes because that vote is taking away a vote from somebody else and is given to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that is critical. And in, in these challenging and it's critical times, we have to make sure everybody has a say. If you are not at the table, you are not participating, people will be there who are going to make decisions which are against your interests, against your next generation, against everything that you stand for. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you have to stand up and, and, and make sure you're counted. So please, if people can get them, I don't care who you vote for. I, I would love for you to vote for the right people that are good, but you have to vote and participate. Yes. Very much so, very much so. Well, Senator, I think uh, we have reached a juncture uh, in our political, in our, in our affairs as a, as a country where immigrant communities must raise their voices um, I, I, and contribute to opinions in the state and national uh, on national issues. Uh, yes. Like you mentioned, we readily support, you know, with uh, paying enormous taxes, you know, we work, we pay taxes like everyone else. Uh, we provide phenomenal labor forces uh, to the country and, um, you know, I, I think it's time for our voices to be heard. You know, we are part of the community. We are part of the country. We have to make our faces known. We have to vote. That's the most critical thing we, we can do, you know, after everything that we do in our daily lives, that we need to vote and make sure that we have a voice at the table at every juncture. Um, this election, uh, you know, I would say we need to, again, go out there and vote. You know, there is nothing else that you can do on Tuesday but to vote, even if you have to take the day off. Please do it. Yes. Just make sure you get in line and you vote if you haven't done the early voting already. Um, what are your plans for your district, you know, for the next cycle? I have no doubt that you're going to win again. So what are your, you know, your plans? Yeah. First of all, Fred, thank you for having me today. And thank you for this important, critical conversation and questions. And also for the community. Uh, you are a leader within the community. And this community is a beautiful group of people. I'm so blessed to be a part of your community. I'm, I'm partially Ghanaian in my mind because of uh, the fact that I work with the Ghanaian community and, and interact with them. Um, and, and I see the beauty of the people. So thank you for having me there. Um, look, we will have to rebuild our lives. Uh, there's no doubt that this, uh, this uh, disaster, the pandemic has taken up so much of our lives and our livelihoods and the institutions and the businesses. We will be a rebuilding phase in the next year. We are also have to take care of the healthcare weaknesses that we have seen. We have seen that certain communities are getting more sick than the others. It is because of policies. We have to fix those policies. We have to give more jobs and rebuild the livelihoods that would require workforce development and putting resources into this. We have to protect the people's homes that actually have had uh, uh, rental issues that they are dealing with. We need to make sure that we big, bring about some of the aspects to take care of that. And then we need to make sure that we protect the 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 craziness that has been happening and then the divisions that we have seen in our society in the past, recent past, we are polarized. We cannot have a Democrat and a Republican sit in a room and then have fun together and have conversations together. We'll have to rebuild that again because this is not healthy for our society to move, move in that direction. Yes, hopefully when we have a change in the White House, hoping and praying that then we will be able to start to have real conversation and talk about our collective shared future. And we will have to work on that. I will be there. And, and, and of course, taking care of the needs of the community. You know I'm available and accessible to you at any time and every time. And to address the issues and, and, and whatever you and the community brings to me, I will try to do the best that I can to serve my East Hartford family, South Windsor, Ellington, East Windsor families, and to take care of them. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you for that. And, uh, you know, I just want to add that, you know, politics aside, you know, we all have it. That's fine. But at the end of the day, we have to recognize that we need to live together. There's no way, there's no future in division. There's no way that we can get to with division. We know that. So it's about decency and restoring the hopes that we all have, you know, the hopes that brought us to this country, wherever we came from. You know, so uh, Senator Anwa, it's been a privilege to know you, uh, considering your many good works and, uh, you know, between the Connecticut and all across the country. Uh, in the past few months, you've effortlessly, effortlessly uh, shuffled between the Senate chambers, uh, the you know, uh, emergency or ICU rooms, because I've seen you in the hospitals almost daily, and your numerous community engagements. You've been an advocate for many across the state who do not have a voice. 
You've been a consistent voice in our communities. And for that, we are very grateful. So we wish you all the best on Tuesday. And we wish everyone, you know, uh, uh, the best on Tuesday who's, uh, you know, who's standing for office. And I have no doubt that you return to the Senate and continue your good works. Uh, so please, thank you again. And we appreciate you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Medase and, and Namesh Rao, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So everyone, thank you for joining us. If you, uh, you joined us on Facebook Live, we appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate your patience. Uh, thank you. I, we hope this was a very, um, you know, healthy conversation. This is something that we wanted to hear from the Senator as a leader in the state. And uh, we hope this was uh, something that you, you know, you think about as you go into Tuesday and uh, as you decide who to vote for. So thank you for joining us. And we wish you all the best. We had our first snow today, so please be safe out there. It's a little slippery. So uh, keep yourself safe and stay warm. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate it. Stay well. Take care. Yeah.